ball was down on the 23-yard line, and he faded back for a pass. Yeah, I saw that game. I... Uh-oh. Well, I guess there won't be any work done around here till we find out whose plans have been picked. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> right. It means being on the biggest job this firm ever had. It means more than that. It means getting out of the drafting room, doing original work, and getting the breaks. Right. I wish you could all win. I'd like to. Thank you Thanks very much. Those boys are sweating blood out there. It's between these two, Hayward and Horn. Well, I'd be inclined to give the edge to Hayward. Hayward, huh? I understand young Horn is a nephew of the Hartman family. Really? They're remodeling their Park Avenue building in June. Oh. Oh. Bill Hayward, telephone. Why don't you look where you're going? Sorry, Bob. Bill is still playing All-American halfback. Is that the way you made that famous run on Amherst? No. This way. <laughs> Hello? Bill, hasn't anything happened? Yeah. I've blown out three blood vessels waiting. Oh, stop worrying. Everyone who saw your drawing said they were marvelous. Sure. Everyone was you. Darling, you sound nervous. It isn't that important. Oh, isn't it? It's the first real chance I've had in the three years I've been in this office. Maybe a long time before the next one. Gentlemen, we wish to thank you for the interest you have shown in this competition, and we have decided that the plan submitted by Mr. Paul Horn will be accepted. Oh, good, oh, good, 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 just learning how to take it, baby. Goodbye. Fresh vegetables, lady? Uh, not today, thanks. Right off the boat, lady. Not interested. Oh, nice new spinach. No sand, see? No, no spinach. Listen. I got something you might be interested in. Yeah? Use any of that? Well, uh, let's have another sample. Mmm, that's very tasty. How many more of those have you? All you want, lady. Come right in, mister. What do you take for the lot? Listen, if you won't tell the lady next door, I'll give you a better price than I give her. Oh, you will? Ice man warned me of this. You come down here and get busy. What a world. Men work and women weep. By the way, whose plans went off this afternoon? Paul Horns. He's a nice guy, but his wife doesn't need a new coat. Well, neither does your wife. Is that so? Well, she's going to get one even if we have to tap the savings account. There isn't any savings account. At least there won't be long. Why? We're going broke. How's that? I'm going on a trip with Mr. Hayward's wife's sweetheart. Oh, you are? Where? Alumni Boynton University. A day of glorious reunion. Darling, we can't squander our money chasing back on a college binge. We can if we need it. Say, are you suggesting this trip because you think this afternoon's setback got under my skin? Yes. And when the next one gets under your skin, we'll take two trips. See my point? Listen. Sing it, Bill. When you're not here, what have I got here? What have I to do? Wait and sigh. Time drags by. When you've got here, things that were not here seem to come with you. And my dull old world looks new. on a glow it just seems to know you are there the wallflowers bloom the firelight grows bold and throws a kiss of gold into your hair then I look at you and think of lovely things we 
wishing that you could stay and the canary sings don't go away when you're in the room a dream's about to start when you're in the room heaven's in Jealousy. How's it feel to be back? It's like the day I entered. I'm so scared I want to go home. Hang on a beat. <laughs> nice going, George. I think one. You Will you look at that? <laughs> hey, fellas, Bill Hayes is back. Hello, Bill. How are you? Hey, you look fine. Daddy, Steve. Why, Ann, Ann. Hello, Harriet. Where have you been? I'm working in law. <laughs> Remember me? Certainly, Harriet. How are you? What year, Bill? 32. 32 is the best class ever came out of this school. <laughs> All right, fellas. Let's give it to him while he's getting it. Nobody loves you like that in New York. Hi, George. Hi, Bill. Come on, halfback. How about a scuttle of sun? <laughs> Little girl, I saw. Forget it. We'll get you to the women's dormitory. They rave and fight about the heroes just as they did in my time. What was your class? 1903. I was two years before you. Well, hi, Prof. How's that? Hi, Professor. Bless me if it isn't George Martin. Isn't he swell? Flew from New York just to conduct for the rally. But how could he find time from his biological work? Oh, he doesn't fool around with that biology stuff anymore, Professor. He gets a grand of platter. A witch? Why, he's just about the hottest kid in New York. Smith, translate that for me. What? He's a child man. A swinger. Yeah. You know, he gets in your hands. He kicks hand. it. He really he gets in it. there and kicks it. If you gentlemen will come down to my level of English, what has Martin been doing since he graduated? Why, he's a second Betty Goodman. An orchestra leader. And I thought that boy might move the world. Well, he's got a fair start, Professor. He moved Harlem over to Park Avenue. Yeah, man. Yes, he did. Harlem. Harlem. Hey, folks. Come on, gather around. George is going to do his stuff. Thank you, you talent lovers, you. <laughs> In the belief that surprises are highly delightful when they're least expected, I'm going to do a little magic for you. I took my first lesson yesterday. I have everything right in the book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cordon G, boys. And, uh, a little soft music. Never leave that out. <laughs> Yes, resistance. The last word. Are you ready? <laughs> now, do you know where it went? In your coat. That's right. <laughs> In chapter three, which I haven't come to yet, <laughs> you lucky devils, it tells you how to take a piece of newspaper. Well, I've been playing the fourth race all afternoon. <laughs> and tear this paper into several thousands of tiny pieces. This little trick uh, comes in very handy at the beginning of the month. When those bills start rolling in, all you have to do is give it a little of that. Incidentally, if this thing works, I'll be more surprised than you'll ever be. <laughs> Quiet, please, please. Where's your attitude?
Let's go. Here's to the class of 32. You My name's Laura Bruschiuno. I guess that includes me. June, a class queen. Where have you been and what have you been doing? I sing with George. I mean with his orchestra. Oh, I've heard you on the radio and didn't know it was you. Maybe that's my fault. No, Bill, I made a great mistake when I lost track of you. I took it kind of hard at the time, but I understood. What good's an all-American with his pants full of pawn tickets? I'll tell you later, at the rally tonight. You're coming to the rally, aren't you? Of course. Of course, we'll all be at the rally tonight. And I want you to know uh, Miss oh, Lane. Say, halfback, there's your old piano. Come on, Bill, give us a little of that old glee club stuff. Lay off me, will you, fellas? You got George over there. <laughs> Come on over, Bill. We'll play it for you. Go on. Come on. You'll never have a chance to sing with a better leader than George. Not with a band like this. Take a bow, boys. Well, what'll it be, boys? The victory song. <laughs> So you remembered me. How could I forget our class queen? One heart, one soul, one song, and a thousand voices. One dream, one goal, one victory to be won. Our loyalty will be undying. We'll always keep our banner flying. We're raring, tearing, sharing, daring. One for all. And all for one, so fall into line, you son of a gun. We'll win, we'll win, we'll win, we'll win we'll fight for the joy of fighting. We'll see, yeah, we'll see our, way. Our, way. our victory is begun. Though we are a thousand strong, we will only bring along one heart, one soul, one I'm proud to be remembered, Mr. Hayward. Come on down and join the party. Oh, no. Oh, he oh, won't. Oh, no. <laughs> Folks, you give me a grand reception, but none of you realize the best thing about me. Allow me to present the best thing about me, Ann Adams, class of 32, my wife. Oh, man! How did an old fossil like you rate a swell girl like Ann? <laughs> I don't know how it happened, but I'm awfully glad it did. You know, I think she really means it. I believe she does. Right? He's breaking my heart. I could feel that way, too. About the right man. Bill. Well, the well candidate number one for me. What? Nothing. Where's the battle tonight? Broderick, dinner at eight, and you're late. I wish that old dame would switch her ideas of amusing people. Why can't she dig up somebody who can do car tricks and lay off ex-football players? She likes you because you always go over big. Well, she's hired this stuffed shirt for the last time. I'm tired of telling Dizzy Flappers how I made the run on Amherst. Whose band is that, George Martin's? Wouldn't you know? Why don't you sick the old girl onto him? He's got what she wants for her parties. Nightclub entertainers wouldn't do on her social list. I don't know why. He drive up there in a limousine. We have to hope it from the subway. He'd certainly suit that Franklin habit, though. Ever watch that rich ape when he's had a couple? He crowds himself onto the piano bench while I'm playing weeps on my shoulder. Speaking of crowding, he's there tonight. Let him weep. Because the Franklins are going to build. Yeah? yeah. Then he can weep all over me. And he likes you. Oh, he probably doesn't know I'm an architect. I told him you're the best in New York. Put me up, darling. Maybe someday I can hire your maid. <laughs> Maybe I'd rather you didn't. Gently rest your head upon my shoulder. The no, never before have 
I've been faced by such a mass of circumstantial evidence. And yet I'd stake my life that the woman is innocent. But try and convince the jury. That's the point. Dad's worried about the jury. He wants more women. Well, I should certainly want women on a jury if I were being tried. Of course. They have a much keener perception. If you had two more women, I'd feel confident. On the contrary, the women I'd be afraid of. Really? Why? Well, a woman will seldom give another woman the benefit of the doubt. She distrusts her too much. But I had them crying yesterday. <laughs> Listen, young lady, I'll have you know I worked very hard for those tears. I know. But a woman will weep with you in the courtroom, then vote against you in the jury room. There's something to that. On the other hand, the men on your jury look like an easy-going, tolerant lot. The live and let live sort. I think they'd be far more sympathetic toward your attractive woman defendant than women would. There's a lot about women you men will never know. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> Go on, sing it some more. Gently you rest your head upon my shoulder. The evening grows older. I hear you're building. Did my wife tell you? No, but I'm with Collins and Fairbanks, so I'm on the lookout. And like that aimless bird, our boat is drifting along. You're an architect, eh? Uh-huh. We draw some mighty pretty pictures in our office. Mm -hmm. Are singing a song. Life is hey, a dream. I've already given that contract to go off the desk bag. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. Yeah, so am I. A mist is over the moon tonight. Dad, you'd better give up golf and come to the office once in a while. <laughs> you know, my ballistic experts swear that bullet didn't come from Mrs. Hoffman's gun. And the state has witnesses who will testify that only she and Kelly were in the street at the time of the shooting. Now, how are you going to offset that? How would you offset that, Anne? Oh, pardon me. Were you speaking of the visibility? What visibility? You see, it was very foggy the morning of the murder. I don't think anyone could have seen more than 20 feet. Are you sure of that? Oh, yes. I happen to remember that particular morning, so I checked with the Weather Bureau just to make sure. That's more than you or any of your assistants did. You'd make a good lawyer, Miss... Uh... This is Ann Adams, Dad. She is a lawyer. Why, she's oh, a very unimportant one. How much do you make? Forty dollars a week. You'd be worth a hundred dollars a week in my office. Really? I'll say you would. <laughs> Thanks for the raise, Mr. Harper. Huh? See, I work in your office now. Oh. <laughs> I told you you'd better give up golf. <laughs> well, that's a good one on me, but I'll make good. Did you, prior to filing this claim against Mr. Howell, attempt to arrange an equitable property settlement? Many times. And his answer was? Uh, that I wouldn't get a cent. Your witness. Mrs. Howell, were you, uh, before your marriage to Mr. Howell, a secretary? Many years ago. Never mind the years. One time in your life, you were part of the business world. And yet you'd ask this court to believe that you'd sign a typewritten document without any idea of the contents. I trusted my husband. He said... Answer my question. Do you claim that you knew nothing of the contents? Yes, I do. Mrs. Howell, at the time you signed this waiver of your property rights, you knew that your husband was a millionaire, didn't you? Yes. I helped him make the money. Mrs. Howell, didn't you receive property settlements from both your previous husbands? Objection. Immaterial irrelevant beside the point in question. Sustained. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hoffman. Go ahead, go ahead. I was sound asleep. You take her on redirect. Mrs. Howell, you're a woman of mature years, and you claim that your experience and business judgment aided your husband's success, and you were for many years familiar with business practices, and yet you ask us to believe that you'd sign a paper without even reading it. I was tricked into it. Ridiculous, Mrs. Howell. You're neither a child nor an idiot. That's all. No further questions. Well, Your Honor, one of our witnesses is ill and unable to appear. I wish to have a deposition read. If the opposing counsel has no objection. No objection. Will you sign this stipulation, Mr. Clark? Aye, sir. Certainly. Thanks. With the court's permission, I should like to read this confession signed by Charles H. Clark. 
Confession? I, Charles H. Clark, do hereby confess that I am a murderer, a bigamist, a thief, a wife beater, a betrayer of public trust. <laughs> Give me that. Order, order. You told me this was a stipulation. Yes, you were tricked into signing your name to a paper you didn't read. You, a fine legal mind, with no special reason for trust or confidence in me, signed a paper the contents of which you didn't question. And you are neither a child nor an idiot, Mr. Clark. <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor, I object to these proceedings. And I ask that they be stricken from the record. Good evening, sir. Hello, Martha. She's late again. Yeah. Everything okay, Martha? Sure. Have a cigar. Why would you be giving me that? Well, it's like this, Martha. You've been with us now, let me see. You came the day after Mrs. Hayward got her first big raise in April. That's right. Well, I think five long months of loyalty and service should be rewarded. So I offer you a cigar. Oh, get along. You know I smoke a pipe. <laughs> Martha, old gal, after five long years of slaving in an architect's office and dreaming of a hundred dollar raise, they wake me up this afternoon to raise me ten glorious smackers. I find the reality is better than expected. In short, I find myself elated. If you ask me, you're cockeyed. On your way. <laughs> I desire privacy while I spring the news on my wife. Darling. Hello, sweet. Holy darling, I'm limp with excitement. Hey, wait a minute. Who told you? Who told me what? Oh, Bill, isn't it marvelous? I'm simply walking on air. Say, just what is it you're excited about? Don't tell me you don't know. Don't tell me you haven't heard. Haven't you seen the paper? Look, Bill. And I won the case. Mr. Harper said I did. And see, a bonus from the firm, a thousand dollars. Gee, Ann, that's terrific. And that's not all. I'm going to be a partner. What? Well, a, a junior partner. There are about ten of us, of course, but, but I'm going to have my own office and, and a private secretary and my name on the door. Me, me, me. Aren't you happy for me, Bill? Of course I am, darling. You'll never know how happy. Oh, there's so many things we can do now. We can get a house and have a car and clothes. I'm going to get oodles and oodles of clothes, Bill. Wait till I tell you about the trial. Oh, what a thrill I had. Bill. Bill, do you realize I'm somebody? Yes, darling. You're somebody. Famous. Take a look. I've been trying to break into that rag for two years. I seem to be coming along all right. Hey, we're telephone. Just a minute, Mr. Hayward. Miss Adams calling. Here's Mr. Hayward. Hello, Mr. Hayward. Just a moment, please. Miss Adams calling. Yes? Is your call, Miss Adams? What call? You wanted to talk to Mr. Hayward. Oh, yes. Put him on. Hello, darling. Hey, look, Ann. If it's all the same to you, I don't get any fun out of holding on to this phone. I'm terribly sorry, darling. Forgive me. Well, I called to remind you about that crowd we're having for dinner. Be home early, won't you? Honey, the best you can is always late. And I'm only a white-collar guy, and I can't walk out of the office as I please. No, we don't actually punch a time clock, but we have to treat office hours with respect. All right. I'll slip out as soon as I dare. Bye. Mrs. Hayward gone down to dinner yet? Yes, sir. They're having cocktails. I brought you one, sir. 
But Langham, you're a mind reader. I noticed you liked one before going out to meet those crowds, sir. Really? Isn't that a new dinner jacket? The old one was getting a bit frayed. When I want you to get me a high-priced dinner jacket, I'll let you know. Very well, sir. Only Mrs. Hayward told me to watch your things and make all necessary replacements. Where'd this come from? Beecham, sir. They have your measurements. I have no account there. Mrs. Hayward opened an account, sir. Listen, when you think I need something, you tip me off and I'll buy it. Very well, sir. The mistake was made in acknowledging the existence of a secret contract. Anne's right. Well, here's my long lost husband. Now we can go in to dinner. Hello, Mr. Hello. Harper. Hello, Bill. You know everybody? Yes. Certainly. Oh. Anne's right. We should have demanded some documentary proof. But if we had, I doubt whether they could have produced it. They did. Suppose they couldn't produce well, it. What difference does it make? Am I right? <laughs> I keep forgetting you're not a lawyer. The suit wasn't based on the second contract. Bill, you're taking in Miss Holland. Oh, hell no. I didn't see you hiding behind the habeas corpuses. By exposing the second contract, we could have confused the issue. We don't stand much chance when these lawyers talk shop. Well, I think that's why Anne asked me. Really? Mm-hmm. It's my job to keep you amused. Do you think you can talk down to my level? Well, I might, if, um, if I had another cocktail. Hurry, before that butler speaks his piece. Dinner is served. Uh... Hide me. At the risk of appearing vulgar, Now, do you four want to take that table? Hello. Hello, Mike. This is Bill Hayward. Do me a favor, will you, Mike? Call me back at Morningside 8, 4167. Say I'm wanted at the office. That's it. Thanks. What will you play for? Ten a point? Oh, I love a good stiff game. That's what makes it a relaxation. Don't you find this, Elaine? Well, I learned that from you. Send a point all right with you, Bill? Anything you like. Hey, with residence? Who's calling? Beg your pardon, sir. But your office is calling on the telephone. I was afraid of that. Excuse me. Hello? Yes? Say, Mr. Hayward, you better come down to the office right away. Yeah, the roof's leaking and the safe has been robbed and the joint's on fire. Outside of that, everything is all right. It's too bad. Hang on to the phone, Mike, in case you need an echo. Why, certainly, I'll be right down. Bill, who's calling from your office tonight? Nobody. So I had the night watchman do it. I want to duck that bridge game. Bill, you can't. Center point? They took me for $80 last week. No, but they must have their bridge, and, and that's the only way they'll play. I thought I got out of it gracefully. Bill, if you lose... I'll, I'll pay my own losses. The only way I'd play. Oh, Bill. Now, you can get a fort somewhere. I'll go out a while, and I'll show up for beer and sandwiches. You don't know how you make me feel. You've got to give them bridge if they want it. That's good business. Now, chase in there and tell them the boss is yelling for me. That's good business, too. Go on, now. Run along. Sky high, my head's in the sky. Here am I, the luckiest guy. I'm up here in the stratosphere with a down to earth romance. I fly like any old bird since I heard that wonderful word. I'm a kite on a solo flight with a down to earth romance. My heart took to booming, my head took to zooming. You kissed me and ooh, that feeling. I sailed through the ceiling. Ho, 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 sky high, I'm riding high. Hear me sigh, you want to know why. I'm the one up above the sun with a down to earth romance. And now it is.
is my sad function to uh, encroach upon the wistful tranquility of your potato salads by performing a small but trite illusion, at the conclusion of which I shall take an almost imperceptible bow, the uh, quintessence of modesty. Then you all applaud and look like a good trick. <laughs> What a racket, what a racket. Well, anyhow, this little swindle consists of two Chinese sticks, and running through the upper ends of the two sticks, we find a length of pure white silk cord, attached to each end of which is a little tassel which seductively dangles in midair for no reason whatsoever. Just think, when I started in this business, I only had one tassel. Now look at me. Well, anyhow, just to make this thing more complicated, I take this pair of silver shears and lavishly sever the fibers without even batting an eye. Just to show you that I did cut the cord, I separate the sticks so as you can plainly see that there is no connection between them. How nice of me. I now place the sticks together and uh, pronounce two highly important magical words, which I uh, forget at the moment, and to our profound stupefaction, we find the cord restored to its original condition. <laughs> no, no, of course, the most unusual factor is the, is the fact that even though the sticks are separated, why the cord runs through just the same. <laughs> I. Uh, Hope that's kindly laughter. I'm, uh, I know what you think. You think the string runs down the stick, under, up, and out the other oh, side? No, 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 no. Not much. <laughs> no. Oh. So it is. Well, I'm terribly sorry to awaken you people at such an unearthly hour, but would you be good enough to take this pair of scissors and cut the cord? It's silly, but then again, we're all taking a cut now. <laughs> you ought to know, boys. <laughs> Stock gag number six. Well, thank you, Doctor. 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 <laughs> I know you're not a doctor, but then again, I call myself a magician. <laughs> well, anyhow, at this point, it is customary to fire the proverbial gun. It's a bit pokey, but it, uh, it uh, serves to accomplish the desired magical effect and also prevents any of you people from falling asleep while this thing is going on. At any rate, now that the cord has been cut at both the top and at the bottom, upon placing the sticks together and pulling on the cord, we find that it runs through just the same. <laughs> eh. Of course, uh, there's no connection between the two sticks. Incidentally, over here we have a very short cord, while over here is a long one. Now, if I pull on the short end of the short, then the short gets over here, we have the short one, while over here is long. Just a case of mind over matter. In other words, you don't mind and I don't matter. <laughs> <coughs> you don't mind and I don't matter. <laughs> I tell that twice, it's awfully funny. <laughs> and vice versa, pulling on the short, the short gets long and the long gets short. But my friends, the most nauseating part about this fascinating little nightmare is the fact that even though the sticks are completely separated, every time I pull on the short end of... <laughs> oh, well, you get a rough idea. <laughs> Bill Hayward's over there. Yeah, go get him. Uh, folks, a little surprise for you. You all remember Bill Hayward, the famous all-American halfback? Well, he's right over there. <laughs> Bill, stand up, please, and take it big. Spotlight. <laughs> Quiet, please. In addition to being the best football player in college, Bill had the best voice on the glee club. Well, I remember the time the glee club passed him a high C and he ran at 90 yards to a touchdown. Now, with a little encouragement from us, maybe he'd get up and sing us a little song. Come on, Bill. <laughs> so you won't sing, huh? You get a break. We know that song you always sing at parties. I'll get you for this, you. Missed over the moon.
I haven't changed much, only you've learned how to dress. Who made it? Beecham. Yeah, Scotch and soda. I haven't seen you since homecoming day, remember? You sprung your wife on us? She's been going places. Hasn't she? Well, you never can tell from where you start. What are you doing? Still building bridges? Houses. That's right. Who'd you say built that coat? Beecham. 200, eh? You can't be doing so badly yourself. Uh, waiter, ask Miss Lane to join us. And bring her highball. Don't worry, she'll have one. She'd lay out that stuff, she'd go places. It's too bad. Maybe you could say something to her. <laughs> Why me? Well, she might listen to you. She always was crazy about you. Sit down, Joan. Thank you. Where's your wife? Entertaining some big wigs. I ran out. Is she still surprised? Surprised? Over being married to you? Well, if she isn't, she still gives a good invitation. How'd you like my song? You were great, June. You weren't so bad yourself. They ate it up. Listen, any time that building business goes sour, you look me up. Well, that voice of yours, you could make plenty of them. Hey, I wouldn't go through that every night for all the gold in the U.S. Mint. so little of each other, I, I feel like a stranger. Shall we introduce ourselves? Yes, let's. My name's Bill Hayward. Oh, you were that famous halfback when I was a little girl. Now you're grown up. And I'm still a famous halfback. Do you know, I believe we got married. So we did. Meet what's his name, the great Aunt Adam's husband. Meet the little girl that's crazy about you, mister. A little girl who used to be crazy about me. Why do you say that? I don't know. You frighten me, darling. I don't know why I said it. Perhaps it's because we're sort of losing track of each other. You're so busy all the time. Oh, it's terrible, isn't it? We used to have a lot of fun, Anne. And we don't anymore, do we? Where's it gone to, Bill? I guess we left it in that little apartment we started in. I'm afraid so. Oh, it's all my fault. Getting myself so deeply involved. Having so little time for us. It isn't worth it, Bill. Really, it isn't. Sometimes I feel like chucking the whole business. No, I don't. I don't know why I lie like that. I don't mean that at all. I couldn't chuck it. You wouldn't want me to, would you, Bill? You wouldn't want me to give it all up? Not if it makes you happy. Every now and then, I, I see a look on your face that frightens me. You're not jealous of my work, are you, darling? Don't be silly. Oh, of course you're not. You're too big a person for that. Sometimes I wish we weren't living quite so lavishly. On my salary... Oh, darling, what difference does it make as long as we have the money? You'll make up for it. Things are just going a little slow for you, that's all. But you've got to be patient. I suppose so. Bill. Promise me you won't get impatient. The Hayward residence? Miss Adams? Who's calling? Just a moment, I'll see. Beg pardon, madam. You're wanted on the telephone. I'm out. It's long distance. Washington calling. Oh, yes. That Lee Wagstaff merger. Ken's down there working on it. It won't be a minute. Hello? Yes. Hello, Ken. Uh-huh. We had that all thrashed out. I don't care what he says. No, no, no. Just the 24,000 shares. Well, of course I can. I can be there in the morning. There's a midnight train. I still have three hours. I don't care how long it takes. We'll stay in Washington until we get it settled one way or the other. Carry it, Langham. Might I ask when Mrs. Hayworth is expected back from Washington, sir? A week or ten days. Why? It's about the servant's wages, sir. Doesn't Mrs. Hayworth's secretary take care of that? Miss Harris left so hurriedly with Mrs. Hayworth. She forgot to make arrangements. Oh, yes. I gladly take care of the other servants, sir, until Mrs. Hayworth gets back. No, thanks. I'm glad you mentioned it. What does it come to? Including the garden for the 15th, $340.
Perhaps you'd better phone Miss Harris in Washington and ask her to telegraph the money. Very good, sir. The company feels that you've made excellent progress, and if the quality of your work continues... How much can I make? Well, Williams, the head of your department, gets 5000 a year. That's almost $100 a week. And he's only been with us uh, a little over 10 years. 10 years, huh? I've seen the Army and Navy game, too. It wasn't so hot. You fellas must get a kick after you're out in the world conducting big business, looking back on the days when you were football celebrities. Yeah. Well, look who's here. Hello, June. I was wondering if you were ever coming back. Have something? Scotch and soda. What drove you here this time? Bridge again? I'm hunting a job. What? George said he could use my golden voice, so I brought it along with me. I'm looking for some of that big dough he was talking about. Well, if it's money you're after, here's to it. You might have had the courtesy to wait until I got back, talk it over with me. What's happened to your ambition, Bill? Don't tell me being a crooner is your idea of a career. What's wrong with it? You might have had more consideration for me. See the position I'll be placed in. Tonight, for example. What'll I say to the Brodericks? My husband couldn't come because he had to work in a nightclub. Oh, I'm sick with it. What's wrong with working in a nightclub? It's honest enough, isn't it? At least I'll be able to pay the servants in my own house. And that means more to me than the opinions of the Snooty Brodericks. I don't care what they think. Well, I do. It's important to me. Yeah, guess it would be. Well, there's something important to me. Did it ever occur to you that I might like to be somebody, too? I'm tired of hearing people say, there goes, what's his name? The great Ann Adams' husband. Bill. You've been slipping off my hook. You've been stepping out and you're acting naughty, naughty, naughty. I'm surprised at you. You're in everybody's book. From Anne, let me take you home, please. Shorty, shorty, no. You know you wouldn't have come without that last drink. Do you think I want them to see how I feel? So you danced and you dined, and you left me behind. Well, you wake up and find. I can play the same kind of army game. I'd forgive and I'd forget. But you'll still be flirting in 1940. Naughty, naughty, I'm surprised at you. over a number. It certainly sizzles. Well, here's to a temperature. That was grand, June. You certainly put that number over. Thank you. And now, customers, the pièce de résistance of the evening, the big moment to you, presenting Bill Hayward. I you will. Paris takes you to her heart when you're in love. Paris was a sweet enchanted city, sunshine on the street and you so pretty. So proud was I to have you walk beside me. I held my head up high. Life was fair, and we owned the earth and air. But we in Paris, the town was ours, for we happened to be. Paris takes you to her heart when you're in love. The parks of Paris were gay with flowers, for we 
happen to be falling in love and Paris takes you to her heart when you're in love out of her heart she sent those nights she allowed us seven and we spent those nights in a seventh heaven that we in Paris the world was ours for we happened to be falling in love and now it's over and we live our lives apart remembering Paris when she took us to her How long are you going to keep this up, Anne? Anne? Oh, hello. I have those briefs ready. They're here somewhere. You gave them to me this morning. Of course. I don't want to be a meddlesome old fool. I'd rather not talk about it. But you've got to talk about it. Of course, you know you haven't been yourself around here for weeks. Perhaps I'd better take a vacation. If he means that much to you, Anne, why don't you go to him and beg him to come back? I did. He wouldn't see me. How'd you get in here? The clerk let me in. Nice of him. So you found the scotch all right. Don't be cross with me, Bill. If you'd lay off that stuff, you'd still have your job. Who are you to rub it in? You've been doing some pretty heavy drinking yourself lately. Wouldn't do any harm if you'd take me out to dinner once in a while. You act as if you're ashamed of me. I know what's the matter. It's that wife of yours. You've got her on the brain. That snooty, hypocritical wife. Shut up! Please, Bill. Don't let me find you here when I come back.
Get me police headquarters. Well, I finally made the front page. This lawyer's real clever, Bill. He won't soak you much. I called his house this morning. All right, Hayward. They're ready for you. Please, Bill. Let's not be fools any longer. I know you didn't do it, and I want to help you. Oh, darling, please. Let me handle your defense. I just came from the DA's office, Bill. They've got a strong circumstantial case against you. You need an expert trial lawyer. There's no one any better than them. I don't want any help from her. But you're on trial for murder, son. Pride shouldn't play any part in this. It's already ruined both of your lives. Good heavens, man, don't be a fool. If you have an ounce of feeling left for the girl, let her do this. Haven't I done enough to her? You think I'll let her be dragged through this, too? Famous woman lawyer defends husband on charge of murdering the other woman. It'll be a field day for the sob sisters. If she stays in the background, they'll forget. Maybe. All right, Bill. I'll defend you. Be seated. Are you ready for the state? We are. Ready for the defense? Ready. Proceed. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the state will attempt to prove that Mr. William Hayward, in a moment of intoxicated frenzy, took the life of a helpless woman. We will show through incontestable testimony that there was incessant quarreling. We have witnesses to prove that he had threatened to take her life. Experts will testify that death came approximately at 4 o'clock in the morning. And we shall prove... They were having a fight. I heard him threaten her. A big drinking party. I don't know what time he came in. He left the club about three. Death by strangulation. On the floor, in front of the sofa. Dead about an hour. Murder. Murder. Murder! Your witness. Doctor, you've given us as your opinion. June Lane came to her death by being strangled with his chain. Yes. You have heard our contention that Miss Lane slipped from the sofa while in an alcoholic stupor and was slowly suffocated by her necklace catching and holding on this ornament. Do you believe in this? No. Doctor, you've seen the mark on the ornament. Yes. Mightn't this chain, catching and holding temporarily, have strangled Miss Lane? I hardly think so. Why not? Because all the evidence points to violent strangulation. But violent strangulation would have caused hemorrhage of the brain, wouldn't it? In most cases. The autopsy shows there was no hemorrhage of the brain. About 25% of strangulation cases do that. Then you think that Miss Lane's case belongs to the 25% of exception? I do, because the vertebra of her neck showed evidence of violence. You think that the injury discovered in the neck vertebra was of such a serious nature, it could only be caused by violence, such as a sharp, heavy jerk with his chain. Not a jerk. A slow, steady twisting. You've heard the contention of the prosecuting attorney that this chain would break under weight sufficient to cause suffocation. I should like the court's permission at this time to make a demonstration. Miss June Lane weighed 116 pounds. We have here a scale certified as to its accuracy. We will subject this chain to a test of one... Objection. Overruled? Of 116 pounds. I ask for your very close attention. Sixty. Eighty. Ninety. One hundred. One hundred and five. <laughs> it's obvious the ornament on the arm of the set T was damaged during transportation. <laughs> According to law, a motive for a crime must be very clearly shown. The prosecutor seemed to ignore that fact entirely. The reason is apparent. 
There was no motive. I don't know how June Lane met her death any more than you or my good friend, the prosecuting attorney. But I do know this. We have no right to convict a man merely on a vague suspicion. The law provides that no man can be found guilty of murder where a reasonable doubt has been established. And no one in this courtroom can deny that a very grave doubt exists as to the guilt of William Hayward. No one saw him do it. The prosecution, in its feeble efforts to pin the crime on him, dwelt at length on the element of time, tried to prove that he was in the presence of June Lane when she died. I, on the other hand, have produced witnesses who testified that he was in a nightclub during that time. There you have a substantial conflict in testimony. There you have a reasonable doubt. If you convict this man, will you not spend the rest of your lives wondering, speculating whether you sent an innocent man to his death? Ladies and gentlemen, the defense has asked you to consider the fact that nothing in Mr. Hayward's character would indicate the possibility of a crime of violence. Suppose we review the history for the past 10 years of this defendant. In college, he was an indifferent student. Indifferent because his mind was on other things. Football was much more important. He became a hero, spoiled and pampered. The next step in his checkered career is his marriage. His marriage to a woman who was forced to go to work because he couldn't or wouldn't support her. A woman both charming and brilliant. One who distinguished herself in her particular calling as no other woman has ever distinguished herself in this city. Did he appreciate it, my friends? No. He immediately gave up his insignificant job and took to a life of ease and dissipation. He became a nightclub rounder. His wife furnished the wherewithal and he squandered it with a generous hand. He concluded his detestable treatment of his charming wife by leaving her. Why? Because nightclub life was more palatable to his depraved taste. There, ladies and gentlemen, you have a man whose entire career indicates that he would ruthlessly remove anyone who interfered with his comfort and happiness. No! No! Order, please. Mr. Harper, I must appear. Order, order. Your Honor, I ask permission for Miss Adams to address the jury. I object. This woman is the defendant's wife. It's an obvious trick to gain sympathy for the defendant. Miss Adams is a lawyer in good standing and my associate. She has a right to appear in this case. Although this request is unusual, it lies within the discretionary power of this court. You may proceed. Your Honor, yes. ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecutor has just drawn for you a ridiculously sympathetic picture of William Hayward's wife. That woman is not worthy of sympathy. She is worthy only of contempt. Contempt for her blindness and stupidity. William Hayward loved his wife. Loved her when they were married. Loved her when they came to New York. He was an average human being. Had a job. Had dreams for a future. He and his wife had a happy life together. But that wasn't enough for that charming and brilliant wife. Oh, no. She wanted luxury, excitement, a career. She went after it, and she got it. A year went by, and William Hayward suddenly found himself married, not to the woman he loved, but to a machine. His home was not his any longer. It was his wife, a meeting place for her business associates. William Hayward never left his wife, ladies and gentlemen. She drove him out. And when she drove him out, she drove out the only beautiful thing in her life. She drove out the man she loved. 
don't waste any sympathy on her. Pity her. Pity any woman who has in her possession the most beautiful thing in life and blindly sacrifices. Oh. Please. Oh, please, mister. Sorry. I've waited for hours. Your autograph's worth a dime now. Young woman, that is beside the point. Very well. I know artists whose autographs bring a quarter. Are you selling the famous Bill Hayward short? Never. Never again. Never again. 